Professor David Nutt, you're allowing me to call you Dave, but I could also call you a neuropsychopharmacologist. You did can. you did you make that name up? Yeah, I used to be a psychopharmacologist, and then I moved to Imperial College 10 years ago, and they said, well, we want you to study the, the brain as well as the psyche, so I can call myself a neuropsychopharmacologist. Um, can you just tell me how many qualifications you have? I've got a few behind us. You're a yeah. fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and the Academy of Medical Science. You hold visiting professorship, professorships in Australia, New Zealand, and the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that you, enough? No, well, I don't know. You, you probably have got more, haven't you? Oh, I've got a, yeah, a few lesser degrees. That's right. How did it start? How did it, oh, it starts, we started actually with alcohol. Uh, in the book, I talk about my very first day as a medical student. And, and, you know, there are nine of us at college, down in College Cambridge. Uh, what do you do when you get together? You know, what we did then back in 1969 is what you do now. You go out for a drink. And by the end of the evening, one of the guys was in a, in a sobbing, weeping, in a, in a state of terrible turmoil. So much I, I said, should we call an ambulance? He's going to kill himself. And one of the other guys who knew him from another school said, no, no, he's always like that when he's drunk. <laughs> and I thought, hang on. So we've been out drinking, a legal drug, and it turns this man into... A sobbing some, mess. Something, a completely different person. I thought, well, that's interesting. Drugs in the brain, you know, that, this is, drugs are a way of probing brain function. You know, it's elicited, brought out in him, something which I guess was always there, but would have been hidden. So is that what, is that what, what drugs do then? They open gateways inside our brains. Yeah, well, I mean, your, the, your brain, our brains, all brains are basically chemical machines. I mean, yeah, they, they've got a lot of neurons, which are electrical machines, but the neurons are forced to connect with each other through chemicals. The eight, chemicals that the body produces. Yeah, the nerves produce chemicals. They're, for each nerve to talk to another nerve, you've got to release a chemical. And uh, there are 80 different chemicals in the brain. And every drug we know that we use, with possible exception of people who shouldn't ever use this drug, which is butane, for you know the, the, the gas, the, the gas. But other drugs, they all work on on the different neurotransmitters. So, when I drink, what does it do to my brain? When I drink alcohol, yes. So what happens is uh, that as the alcohol gets into your brain, it starts to turn on some systems in your brain. It, and the reason we like to drink for most people is it relaxes us. And that is due to the enhanced effect of a, the brain's relaxing transmitter called GABA. GABA calms you down. Alcohol boosts GABA, calms you down. Then as you drink a bit more, you start to release a bit of dopamine. Now, dopamine is a transmitter that drugs like stimulants, cocaine work on. Is it a re reward stimulant? Is well, it? it's uh, part one of them. Well, it's not, that's not just what it does. What it does more, actually, than reward is um, motivate and driving. People get activated and animated. Switched on. Switched on, yeah. So the dope alcohol releases a bit of dopamine, not as much as cocaine, but enough to make you enjoy it and most, enough to make you feel part of life. And then as you push it up a bit more, you start to re release endorphins, which are the, you know. The aggress, they're like you. No, they calm you down. No, no endorphins. endorphins. So, endorphins. I, so endorphins calm you down. Endorphins, endorphins are like, like heroin. You know, they, they sort of put you in a slightly, they, they give you euphoria they, and they make you high. The, the runner's high used to be thought to be due to endorphins. It probably is to some extent. So that's a sort of positive feeling. And then as you keep pushing those, you get a bit of serotonin released. Serotonin, a bit like ecstasy. You know, you start to love each other, you know, become more, in, more concerned. It's all more, sounding good so far. It is. And then, and then you get to a level, which is about, when you get over about twice the drink driving limit, then you get into real, that's where the trouble starts, because then you start to block neurotransmitters. And your you, body does this because what, what, what your the alcohol does. No, no, the alcohol blocks oh, it. So, so it stops you transmit your brain function. Yeah, and that's where you start to forget things because it blocks a transmitter yeah. that, called glutamate, which makes you remember. So then you get blackouts. And of course, if you keep pushing it up and up, you, you dampen your brain down. Alcohol is an anesthetic. And eventually it will calm your brain down. It will block transmission to a point where you stop breathing and die. So that's, that's the true ending of alcoholic poisoning is actually if you die. You usually die of respiratory uh, so distress. You, you know, so you stop sending messages to your heart and to your lungs Correct. to breathe. That's right. Yeah. And about three young people a week 
died just of alcohol poison in this country. Three young people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is one thing that I did read in the book, and I think it's very interesting. You, you said you try and buy an 18th birthday card or a 21st birthday card that does not have some reference to alcohol in it, and it's quite difficult. It's champagne it corks, it's beers, it's right. let's get pie-eyed, whatever it is. It's so difficult. So I set myself that challenge once, and I, I didn't realize how difficult it was because I was determined I was not going to send a card encouraging drinking. You're an expert on, as you say, on the effects that drugs have on human beings. And did you say that you've actually probably, there's not many people alive that have given so many different drugs to so many different people? Or something well, like I'm very ones? old, so I've had plenty of time to do research. But I reckon I've probably given more different kinds of drugs to human beings than anyone I know alive. Yeah. Why, do you, why do you say that alcohol is the worst drug out there? So in the UK, alcohol is the most harmful drug to the UK because it's so widely used. It's not the most harmful drug to the user. I mean, you know, if you, if you, there are other drugs which are going to be are more dangerous. I mean, heroin, fentanyl, crack mm. cocaine, spice. They're more harmful to you as a user. But thankfully, they're not widely used. But alcohol is so widely used that I bet every family in the country is affected one way or the other by alcohol, either through someone drinking too much or someone being damaged by a drunk driver or got into a fight mm. or something. And it's legal, of course. And it is absolutely legal, and pretty much every other drug isn't. So the only drug you can use to relax yourself or to, to enjoy a, a social occasion that's legal is alcohol. And, and that, actually, that's wrong, I think. You'd say now, if it was invented today, it would be declared an illegal drug. It would be if we applied the same criteria as we currently apply. That's right. And, and Would it be Class C? No, it would be probably B. It's it would be a Class B it drug. It would be a Class B drug, yes. It's on the threshold of A and B in terms of the harm to the user. Yeah. But it's it's also about the cost, not only to the individual, but to the country as a whole. Yes. But also it's a big uh, generator mm -hmm. of, of finance for governments, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So this is the card that the alcohol industry plays all the time. It says, look, you know, we contribute 20 billion in taxes and we provide a lot of jobs. <coughs> and that is true. But then on the other side of the equation, you know, it's three and a half billion in healthcare costs, six and a half billion in policing costs, 20 billion in lost uh, production from hangovers and things. So the net balance is all, it's- It's a debt, it's isn't a it? It's a debt, it's a debt. It's we, a debt that approaches around 20 billion pounds. That's yeah. right, so all taxpayers are paying that much in order to allow them to do what they do, which is to drink as they want to drink. And I always think it's a bit hard on those people who don't drink at all because they're forced to pay their taxes and subsidize the drinking of those who do. I, I did a documentary about alcohol um, and I think we were definitely put under pressure to an extent to not be as damning mm -hmm. as we could have been. And I am a drinker. I mean, I'll put my hands well, up. So and, I. You know, it, it, it is probably, it is my, my drug of choice. Mm. Um, and I love red wine. And I used to drink, I used to be a member of rugby clubs or many right. rugby clubs. And mm. watering can would come around. And you'd have no idea exactly how much you had consumed yeah. until I'd definitely gone past, what, the fifth <laughs> or the sixth stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you saw the effects it could have on people on a Saturday night. If you start drinking after a game about 4.30, yeah. there are people still in there at 11 o'clock yeah. at night in a very different state to the one that they started it in. Yeah. Well, so a couple of important messages there. Two I make in the book. The first is never drink to hydrate. You know, drinking after sports is fun, but people often drink too much because they're trying to rehydrate themselves. So don't use... Even beer, even relatively weak beer, don't use that to rehydrate after sport. Always rehydrate first and then drink. And the second is actually sort of count what you're drinking and never allow someone to fill your glass when it's not empty. So, so you give me now, give me the Ross Kemp guide to drinking, please. Or your actual guide to drinking, but the, how, the way I should yeah. behave when I go out. So, if I want to avoid a cracking hangover, poisoning myself, giving myself everything from Alzheimer's to cancer to cirrhosis. Right, so decide what you what risks you want to take with your drinking. Okay, so let's assume. I mean, I, it already sounds too risky. Go, but well, you don't have to drink at all, then. You know, it's true, but, it no, is, but I'm probably am going to because there's so much social pressure put on yeah, okay. people, and also I quite like it. So that's so the, the the really interesting thing about alcohol, unlike say tobacco, <laughs> is that the relationship between consumption and harm is. It's not straight. It goes up it's like, a, up like a very steep mountain once you get over about a bottle of wine a day. 
So the first message will be absolutely clear to anyone, never drink more than a bottle of wine a day. I was, I was signing some books at the Barbican on Sunday, and a guy came up to, see, up to me, and he said, I never, I've been drinking two bottles of claret since I was 12. He said, I, I never drink more than one bottle of wine at lunch. <laughs> That's not quite it's expensive after you lunch, doesn't it, I guess? Yeah. Um, so, Go on. ideally, if you, if you stick to the government recommended limits, of which are 14 units... Uh, Oh, do you know what? Can we just be real? Let's let's just break that down because yeah, sure. a unit is such a what kind is, of yeah. what is a unit? Eight grams. There you go. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, that'd be handy. I carry my scales around <laughs> yes, with me. Sure. I know it's um, probably get arrested for being a dealer if I did. <laughs> go on. So, we'll yeah. just keep but how do you? I mean, so yeah. quantify what? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, so it, it, depending on what you're doing, but it's it's worth knowing. Yeah, this is an important point. It's worth having an idea of what you are drinking. So one of the key messages is try to work out what you are drinking. Try to remember, over, keep a diary for a week and just see what you are drinking. Yeah. And then see how where you are in relation to the 14 years. Everybody lies. I think doctors, all GPs, when I spoke to GPs, when I made a documentary, he said, we look at what someone fills in and then we times it by four or five because people always lie. This is why... This is about you doing this for yourself. Right. If you're going to lie to yourself, well, can't we just forget it, you know. But if you actually are serious in thinking about your drinking, then keep a proper diary. That's the first thing. And the second thing is to look at the drinks you drink and see which of those you were really worthwhile mm. and which of them were just habit. And then get rid of the habit ones. Because I, I believe that one of the, uh, keeping a, having an estimate of what you drink, you should know that pretty reasonably. It will be, it's like knowing how heavy you are or what your blood pressure is or what your cholesterol mm. is. Now, you know those things. So I think if everyone could be relatively clear as to what they're drinking, that'll help them make sensible decisions. I mean, I, mean, I summed up the film that we made, which, you know, was two or three years or years ago. But, you know, if we all basically drank a little bit less, we'd all live a little bit longer Correct. And probably be a little bit more happier across the board because you're be causing, yeah. causing the pain and distress that you eventually cause hangovers. Yeah, right. I mean, the anger that that can cause inside a family unit, you know, Absolutely. you just sort of, yeah. I mean, as you say, carry on. Give me my rules for drinking. So if I go out for an evening, I read some of them. One was uh, by the third round, for instance, because you can make that, if you're buying, you can make that a non alcoholic yeah, exactly. drink. Exactly. That's got a clever trick, but, yeah. But but you'll probably get peer pressure, particularly at a certain age, that you are wimping out or you're yes. not a true man or you're not part no, the of the point party about or the whatever. Third round is that you don't tell them. Right. They, don't, the drinking you know, beers. they don't know what you're yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you you know, you you're getting the round yeah, in, too. so you know, this is yours, this is yours, and this is mine. What you're drinking you know, And another one is which I I sort of thought was counterintuitive, but obviously you know what you're talking about. I don't. A pint of beer before you start on the wine to fill you up. Yes. Well that's what I do. <laughs> well, is that because you like beer and then wine or is it because there is actually some science I like behind I like but, both. But is, there science, is there science behind that well I, I, only that the more full your stomach I mean you'd have to drink beer you can drink a bottle of water, water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but on the other hand you don't get into the party spirit drinking a bottle no, of no, water no 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 that's you. right so it's just uh, but don't drink strong beer don't drink you know 8% IPA yeah. <laughs> that's what people do though and, and there's well, a massive there's a massive movement there is that. although to be fair they're serving the stronger beers in smaller amounts now yeah. So yeah, just be aware of that. The well, reason it's there only seven and a half pints is because well, they're twice as strong. But France, uh, that Dave, if I may, um, had a massive issue with alcohol and they managed to kind of implement structures that changed that from advertising to, to just like social. It was, it, it was seen to be socially incorrect Correct. to get absolutely smashed. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's still, so, why is it so prevalent in British culture? Is it part of the way our makeup or is it just, we just haven't caught up with everybody else yet? Yeah. Well, I think it's important to say s several things. The first is, yeah, the French did instigate wonderful rational policies to reduce the consumption. So 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the French were drinking three times what we were. And they were dying at, or with from liver disease at rates which are six times ours. They have reduced consumption uh, through a number of ways, usually through pricing, uh, through reducing the drink driving limit, and through stopping advertising. Uh, and it's been remarkable. So they've reduced their consumption. So now we drink more than them. A lot more than them. We drink not a lot more, but we've but we've 
doubled our consumption and they've reduced their consumption to a third. So they, we've our powers are crossed. Well, why why is that? And that's because they've done the right things and we haven't. So you know we we still have alcohol advertising. The French don't. And I, people say, well, we've got to have alcohol advertising or so we'll never win the World Cup at football. And I say, well, the French seem to manage it. <laughs> More <laughs> so, frequently than we have. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So that's well, the first thing. The French England the has. French approach was, and it was driven by a scientist, Pierre Roche, you know, you know who was, you know, I knew when I was younger. And, you know, it was a scientific driven approach. What we've done is we've allowed the drinks industry to dominate our policies. And the big increase in harms in alcohol in Britain has come from people buying booze in supermarkets and drinking at home. Yeah, that was it was it's a drinking behind closed doors. You know, when Absolutely. there when there were pubs, there was a landlord and he was there for a reason. And also if you got drunk continuously in that pub, you were no longer welcome, not yes. only by the landlord, but also by your fellow drinkers. That's right. That's you know, right. it was socially unacceptable. But if I want to go to Tesco or any other supermarket, let's mention Sainsbury's and all the other ones as well before we get sued, <laughs> Mark Suspenses included, um, I can go and buy a crate of wine, take it home and sit there and carry an opening bowls if I'm on my own with the curtains drawn until I collapse in a stupor or throw up or, exactly. or kill myself. Exactly. There is no, there are no yeah. rules. No. And and also, you're encouraged to buy two for one or three yes. for one. Well, they should. So that's an interesting point. And I completely support what you're saying. And the Scots, of course, have confronted this. With the so, units, which I- With the minimum pricing. Yeah. Let's explain, yeah. explain yeah. that. Yeah. So, so the Scots have now achieved this unwelcome- record of being having the worst levels of cirrhosis in the world. Actually, interestingly, not because of the heaviest drinkers. The Russians are way the heaviest drinkers, but the Russians drink so much, they don't even live long enough to get cirrhosis. They just die of alcohol poisoning. Half of all Russian men die of alcohol. 50%. 50% of Russian men. Anyway, put that to one side. The Scots are now got the highest levels of cirrhosis in the world, up up to 40% of all their intensive care beds. 40%? For 0%. Up to 40% of all their intensive care beds are are occupied by people who are dying of alcohol-related disorder, like cirrhosis. And eight years ago, they decided to do something about it, and they decided to do minimum unit pricing. So, i.e., it's pricing a unit of alcohol at 50 pence. Yes, or some, some acceptable. Level. Yeah, which, which was obviously not going to be welcomed by the alcohol industry because, it's, mm. because the lower you price alcohol, the more you're going to sell, right? Well, it's complicated. It's complicated. Explain, it uncomplicate was, it for me. So, the interesting thing about the French experiment we just talked about mm was that they priced out cheap booze. They priced out cheap booze by a kind of minimum pricing. They made all French wine a proper controlled quality wine. That's more profitable. The French drink less wine, but their wine industry makes more profit. Because it's priced higher, yeah? Exactly. Now, the, <laughs> the drinks industry in Britain know this is true. They know that minimum unit pricing would actually probably make them more money. But they've opposed it simply because they don't want any to give any concession to the anti-drink uh, Lobby. lobbyist. The, so what they say is, oh, look, 50p a unit, that's punishing the responsible drinker like you. And I say to you, I bet you don't buy any booze. <laughs> I don't less buy, than 50p look, a unit. They were drinking, we were looking at, at alcohol amongst young people, and they were drinking Frosty Jack, which is a very, very... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. strong cider mm-hmm. that you could buy in in shops for absolutely nothing, like 50 pence for a litre, something That's like right. that, two pounds That's for exactly. a litre, less than that. And I met a guy who had once been a psychiatric nurse that ended up living in a cupboard that was drinking 25 to 30 litres of cider a day. Mm-hmm. Why are we allowed to encourage people to buy alcohol that cheaply when we know that potentially not only is it harmful to them, it's harmful to other people That's around right. them? And also leads on to doing other things. The reason that it's because the drinks industry has a principle, which is that people should drink. They don't care what they drink as long as they drink, because the more alcohol sold, the more people are drinking, the more people are addicted to alcohol, the more they're going to buy booze. So the Scots have done the Scot. The the, the thing about fifteen p minimum unit pricing is that it takes out the cheap ciders, the frosty jacks, takes takes out the young people drinking, and it also reduces consumption in the alcoholics, the very severe end, the mm. ones that are going into intensive care. Mm. If you reduce their consumption by 10%, you actually reduce the health risks by over 30% because of the very steep curve. So the cost to the National Health Service or whatever it may be, you're reducing that dramatically. Yeah, because yeah. you take someone out of intensive care. But it's care. not just that, is it? Sorry, it's not just that, is it? Yeah. It's, it's policing. 
It's it's not just the actual cost of a bed. It's having those extra nurses. It's also having to have police in casualty Absolutely. to protect staff. Exactly. It's also just, you know, the random accidents that happen, Precisely. you know, not just in cars, but all, you know. From people don't realise how, how vulnerable drunk people are the easiest target. And it's also being sexual exploitation well, as well. Too. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, being, you know, being intoxicated so you don't know what's going on around you makes you very vulnerable. I was one of the things that I was reading about, you know, the difference between, let's say, marijuana and alcohol. Could you just really clear that one up for me? What's the difference? You smoke one. You smoke one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you inhale uh, you one. Can, yeah. yeah, yeah. You could ingest yeah. it as well, though, couldn't you? Yeah, but um, ingesting, yeah, is it, one, of the advant- one of the reasons that marijuana is safe is that you do smoke it. Paradoxically, because as soon as you stop, as long as you start smoking, you start, you start going into your body. One of the reasons alcohol is not so safe, you drink a litre of vodka like Amy Winehouse and you can get rid of it. And it's in there and it's poisoning you. So I was being slightly facetious about smoking cannabis, but there is a safety measure to smoking over, over ingesting at one level. Well, what about the actual effect that it has on you neurologically? Yeah, very, very different. And the main reason cannabis is much, much safer than alcohol is that it does not suppress breathing. In fact, it might even facilitate breathing. Really? So, yeah. so why is it illegal? Well, it's illegal because uh, it's a re- relatively recent invention. I mean, it's not a recent invention. It's it's a plant that's been around for, for yeah, s- but it, uh, yeah, so the it ages. <laughs> yeah, but the actual first emergence of the uh, THC containing mm. uh, cannabis, uh, what's called the Banga. Yeah. came in from India in about 1680. So that's relatively 1680. recent. 1680. Yeah. I mean, it's not that recent, but but the, the, it's... No, um, what you're saying is that the people actively smoked it to get high because hemp's been in around yeah, the Yeah, Henry for, VIII had a rule that every farm in Britain had to have a field of hemp so you could make canvas for the ships. Yeah. But camb- hemp is kind of a dial, so people didn't get high. There's no THC in hemp? Well, there's a tiny bit, but you've got to smoke a lot of hemp to get high. Right. Uh, and people didn't know about smoking in those days because they hadn't invented tobacco. Well, they hadn't brought tobacco. Tobacco, really. yeah, yeah, yes. But... Um, Can- cannabis was a medicine uh, until about – it was easily available. People used to use it as a tincture. People used to put it in their tea to deal with their sort of pains and, and, and epilepsy and stuff until about the 1880s. And then the, there was a strong Puritan prohibition movement. They tried to take out all drugs. There's been a big religious movement historically to yes. kind of stop all things. That's right. Alcohol, Absolutely. any drugs, anything that has yeah. an, a mind-altering well, that's right. effect – And they, the they started off and they got they managed to get rid of cannabis and they managed to get rid of um, codeine and, to some extent. And then they tried to take on alcohol. And in some countries, in America, they got rid of alcohol. Prohibition. But in Britain, they didn't. Uh, and since then, the drinks industry has been fighting an extraordinarily efficient battle to keep alcohol, but to make sure none of the other drugs come. So the resistance to cannabis being uh, recreational is to some extent driven by the drinks industry not wanting competition. Really? Oh, absolutely. You see, in the, you see in the states where now 11 states have voted for recreational cannabis, yeah. you see that the lobby against that is driven largely by the drinks industry. Yeah, tell you, if you talk to a police officer who he'd rather deal with, absolutely. someone who's stoned or someone who's pissed, yeah. paralytic, yeah. he's going to go for the stoner every day. Uh, absolutely. In fact, the police were quite... The police were very positive about legalizing cannabis back in the early 2000s when the committee I was on, the ACMD, we, we downgraded cannabis from, uh, from grade A and B to, to class C. Then and it the, got pushed back up again, did yeah, it not? Yeah, the police were really supportive. And then, yeah, then um, Gordon Brown decided he wanted to get votes by being hard on drugs, and so everything went backwards. It was a, it was a political decision, not a health decision. Yeah. And then the police changed uh, because there, uh, they started incentivizing the police to arrest people for cannabis, and suddenly the police hate cannabis. <laughs> Even though, as you say, they know it's much It's, it's much easier to much deal easier with someone. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it a gateway drug, cannabis? No, it's not a gateway drug. By that I mean, does it lead you on to taking stronger no. No. substances or other substances that are, are classified higher in the alphabet? No. It's not a gateway drug unless you sell it the way we sell it. So if you sell it in the back streets where your dealer will always offer you, you know, three for two, here, have your cannabis, but here's a bit of crack, here's a little bit of H, it's a gateway drug. Whereas in the Netherlands, it's not a gateway drug. And the reason the Dutch set up the coffee shops 40 years ago was explicitly to separate the cannabis market, which they knew their kids were going to use anyway, mm-hmm. from, from the hard drugs. 
And they said, our kids are going to get the cannabis and we'll never meet a dealer. And they never meet a dealer and they have virtually no use of heroin in their young people. But if you go back to what, what was called the, the British system, that's right, which was opposite of the American system, but the British system was to treat people who were addicts mm -hmm. as, as, as medical... As human beings. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, but also as people with a medical Absolutely. issue, a medical Absolutely. problem that could be dealt with, a, with, right. with, 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 with a GP, yeah. not with a police officer. Absolutely. Not by putting them into prison. And do you know why it changed? It changed in 1971 explicitly because of pressure from the US mm. to conform to their philosophy. And we see it all along. I was just talking with um, my colleague on the way here today. The big battle going on over vaping mm. e-cigarettes. The Americans want to eliminate e-cigarettes, even though they don't want to eliminate cigarettes. And they're putting huge pressure on British authorities to, to ban well, e-cigarettes. Because they grow so much tobacco in the United States of America? You could say. Uh, that's possibly part of the reason but but it's more i think that they that their whole philosophy is about banning rather than harm reduction so in, as you said in 1971 there were 1000 heroin addicts in britain mostly in london getting prescribed heroin so, the americans said you've got to stop prescribing it contravenes the un conventions so we stopped because we all, all our drug laws have been made at their behest and in 20 years we went from 1000 addicts to 200000 addicts why because every addict has to generate 25 new addicts to buy enough heroin from them to pay for their own habit. Right. So when it was prescribed and it was that virtually free, there wasn't the crime attached to it, so Absolutely. therefore there wasn't the issue and there wasn't the explosion of addicts. I mean, and, I, and worse than people that... People will say that's a very over-simplistic yeah. way of looking at the explosion of the use of heroin and other drugs, but... I'm, I am, you know, if you go back even earlier than that, and if you go back to the 50s, there was something like 300 heroin addicts that were actually of note in yeah. this country. That's right. um, and and uh, where we are now, if you look at prisons, I think 50% mm -hmm. of all people in prison are either doing time because of drugs or being associated. That's right. The drugs. doubling of our prison population in the last 40 years is all, it's all driven by drug crime, supposed drug crime. And you look at Portugal, which has actually emptied its prisons because it's decriminalized drug use and treats it as a medical problem. I mean, we, we but all decisions that have been made in this country for the last 50 years. Are they years all financial? Are they all, are they no, all they're all political. They're not financial. No. The w most expensive way of dealing with drugs is to put people in prison. You Absolutely. Know. It's £40,000. Look at every prisoner in the UK yeah. is forty grand on your yeah. tax every That's year. Absolutely. And then there's all the, all the testing, <laughs> testing equipment for their drugs. No, the, it's the most expensive way. It's the most irrational way. We do it because we just like to punish people. Do you think that's true? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's our politicians. Our, politi it's our politicians are all embedded in this. Thing. Well, to make someone an object of hate and and and, and, and you know make them despicable, get people to vote. You know, people who don't vote, drug addicts don't vote. So it doesn't matter what you do with them, even if it costs money. Someone's suffering. You know, it's it's all the decisions have been political. It's actually very distressing they, to you, watch. That. You have very famously falling out with those politicians. Right. Someone might say there's no one here to defend them, so I, I will do my my best, though I'm not sure I, mm -hmm. I agree necessarily with, with some, of the, some of the views that have, have been taken by our politicians over the years. Mm -hmm. um, you were an advisor to the mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. for a number of years mm -hmm. on drugs and alcohol. Ten years. But, well, they wouldn't let us advise on alcohol. They said it wasn't a drug. But you were part of a committee, but the, didn't David Cameron make sure that it was fifty percent uh, people in the in the in the drink industry and fifty percent academics and people who That's might right. not be pro the drink industry? So that leaves you with yes, no majority either way. Well, we thought it was we thought it was what's called a conflict of interest. But what? Yeah, well, I'm in trying to the drink industry on the committee. So I, I work for I don't know Perno or Diageo, one of the big just one of the big um, alcohol selling. Uh, companies and you're an a academic that's saying that people should mod moderate mm. what I sell. It's not going to work, is it? It didn't work, and the academics all resigned. Yeah, they all resigned. They all resigned. Yeah, the committee. The committee's been disbanded because it cannot work. So the, the, you gave an example earlier on. You didn't in relation. The only the only decision that that the drinks industry would agree with in terms of messaging about harm was to say drink responsibly. And as we all know, mostly that's why we drink, to lose responsibility. Why did the government ask you to resign, Dave? Well, they asked me to resign because I said alcohol was a relatively well, was the most harmful drug in Britain. And they did not what like about it. What about the equine ecstasy? Oh, the ex... Ah, uh, that was the... Sorry. Oh, you, let, me, 
I got to, okay, so let's. No, 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 but let's just talk a about it. Great story. So, um, so I had two big fall ins with the government. The one I've just talked about fall earlier. Fallouts or fall ins? Oh, fall out, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry, no, sorry, you're allowed. You out. fell in with them first, then you fell out <laughs> with them. fell out with them, that's right. So the, the second one was when I said alcohol was the most biggest problem and we should be controlling it, thinking about controlling it under the Misuse of Drugs Act. But the first one was about ecstasy. And uh, this was when Jackie Smith was the Home Secretary. And uh, the Labour government did not want to, to review the harms, the class of exit. Class actually was put into class A back in the 1980s. And well, Leah, after the death of Leah Betts, was Yeah, it? around about that time, yeah. And she, the government did not want to review it because they knew it, it shouldn't be class A. It wasn't that harmful, right? Well, 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 if people were dying of it, why was it not harmful? Well, very few people were dying of it. I mean, you know, that sub subsequently, and we've researched this, has gone up significantly. Well, that's a different question. And I'll tell you, I'll come back to why that's happened. That is a, the increase in deaths from ecstasy is a direct and predictable response to the current policy. It class, class, classing it as A. But what about for you personally? Um, we talk about toughest moments in your yeah. life. Um, can you tell me what, what's been the toughest moment in your life? Well, certainly being being sacked by uh, Alan Johnson, that was that was a pretty disturbing experience. Well, Not least of all because it came through in an email <laughs> just before I was about to give a lecture. You're sacked. <laughs> but, but but why did it? Why why did that? Of all the things that, that have happened in your life, all the personal things that happened in your life, why was that? Why did that? Well, because I spent industry? ten years trying to make this country a better place by improving understanding of drug harms and improving the drug laws. I'd worked my butt off to try to get it right. And I was being sacked just for what I thought was just a kind of trivial uh, reason, which was that I just disagreed with him. And it just seemed, it just seemed completely inappropriate. Was it him or was it advisors to him? <laughs> That's a great story. So, well, of course, it was almost every decision was made by Gordon Brown. And there was a peculiar coming together of the fates that weekend because the science minister was in Japan racing his classic racing car. Uh, so he wasn't on, he wasn't informed. And that sounds he, very new labor. Uh, yeah. Well, he was very rich. He was that kind of new labor. Yes. He yeah, had yeah. a Lola by the way. And uh, right. so he was in Japan and then um, it is a bit odd for a minister to be doing that sort of thing. Is it? Well, never mind. He was in the house of yeah. Lords uh, and the, uh, the, the, the chief scientist who was actually a friend of mine, David Bennington from Imperial college. He was in, Uzbekistan that weekend and he rang me before I got sacked saying are you alright and I said yeah I'm alright I thought why is he ringing me he said look I'm going to be in Uzbekistan I won't have any phone contact so you're sure you're alright I said yeah I'm fine What's that? You know. well wouldn't I be did he what? have did he have pre, pre knowledge I, then? I, I, I kind of think within hindsight maybe he maybe he thought things could go wrong right they did. okay yeah. <laughs> yeah but carry on so so the, the minister's away and your friend's away. Yeah. And then, and then what? You get an email, you're sacked. I an, yeah, I got an email saying, you're sacked. And I wrote back and said, this is, this is not right. You know, and my job is to give you advice and you don't have to take it, but you don't have to sack me for giving you advice. And he said, you're sacked. I just think they thought that we can't control this guy. You know, he's, if he keeps on telling the truth, where is it going to end? <laughs> he'll, he'll start telling us we shouldn't have drug laws next. What happened with the variant ministers? Well, I, I had this very surreal conversation on the today program uh, and uh, we just on radio four, on radio yeah. four we just done this analysis that has shown that uh, that alcohol was actually the most harmful drug and one of the one of the interviewers said well you're not seriously telling us that uh, lsd is less harmful than alcohol and i said of course it is and of course the world just ended you know i mean hysteria hit you know got phoned up by all the right-wing press you know what are you you know you're a bloody hippie you know you're encouraging kids i mean it was all absurd and then I um, did you point I out you've done more research into the name possibly may have, may have yeah done. I did that actually I did uh, did, did it help no I didn't not really. no <laughs> <laughs> and then they took uh, pictures of your kids didn't they the yeah place. the worst thing of all was after I got sacked I got this phone call um, when I was sitting at I was just going off the next weekend to give a lecture in Paris and I got this phone call in the airport and the guy said I'm you know I'm Dave from the Sun and I said who and he said look I'm going to tell you that tomorrow we're doing an expose or your three of your kids drinking. And I said, well, that's outrageous. You can't do that. And he said, what do you think about it? I said, well, that's just outrageous. And uh, I put the phone down. And then I, uh, I rang the press complaints people and said, what have they done? And they, they'd hacked into three of my kids' Facebook accounts. And they'd shown a picture of, uh, of one of my sons smoking a roll-up and said he was stoned. 
They took a picture of, a, of my 15-year-old daughter pretending to be drunk, but she never drunk in her life. It was just a sort of game, you know, let's pretend to be drunk. Mm. And they took a picture of my son who lives in Sweden coming out of a sauna in the snow without any clothes on. I mean, none of it relating to, to alcohol at all. It's just, it's just it's, it's, you know, you become fair game as soon as you become, you know. Well, as soon media. as you put your head above the parapet and yeah. say what you think, particularly once you're, be, yeah. you're an expert in that field, then you're fair game if you go against what they want. Absolutely. They want. Yeah. And of course, and it started with the sun and then the, it got into the mail and the mail on Sunday. And actually, to be fair, we, the sun took it down after the press complaints people um, mm. made their complaints. But the mail didn't. And I said to them, well, why can't you get the mail to take it down? And yeah. they said, well, you've got to realize that the, the Paul Dacre, the editor of the mail, is the chair of the Press Complaints Authority. At which point I began to think, we got, don't quite understand conflicts of interest here, do we? I mean, Not <laughs> really. In fact, they, they didn't take it down. Interestingly, they didn't take it down till Dacre was taken before the um, Leveson inquiry. Right. That week he took it down. Because it was part of the Leveson. Why would um, they keep it up for so long? Anyway, yeah. I mean, and 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 let's let's not shy away ever t- talking the truth here. Yeah. You, you own a wine bar. Yeah, I do. Well, my daughter runs it. I sort of uh, helped to set it up. Yeah, and I'm yeah. yeah, I'm a director. I'm a co-director of the wine bar. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, but you, you, so you're not you're not you're not saying to the drinks industry you're evil personified. No. You're just saying we need to look at the way we consume alcohol. Absolutely, that's exactly what I'm. I'm saying if everyone just drank in. Bars, pubs, and wine bars. Uh, and we set up the wine bar, by the way, because it was a safe space for women to drink. Do women drink differently at yes. different ages, and do men drink differently at, yeah. at different ages? Well, this is complicated, but but there's Go a, on, uncomplicated for me, Dave. Right. So, in young in binging is common in both young men and women. Yeah, binging, but binging's been around for a long time, yeah, hasn't it? It's been around. So I'm world. really good. I go to the gym, I work out all week, and then Friday comes along. But hey, yeah. binging all your units in one week, it's one worse. weekend, is worse than spreading them out. Why is that? Because, Tox- yeah, because the level of the toxicity relates to the concentration. The more you drink, the higher the concentration. That's the first thing. Yeah, as you said earlier, you said the difference between maybe inhaling marijuana is it's in your system and then you're exhaling it out and it won't hang around so long. But if you drink a lot of alcohol through an evening, it's just staying in your system, recirculating. The second thing damage. it does is it causes, the, it causes inflammation. And inflammation is what begins to damage the brain. So we know that people who binge drink have more impaired brain function than people that drink the same amount but don't binge drink. Okay, that's a right. that's note. So bingers have more inflamed brains yep. than the non-bingers. That's right, yeah. And, and the third thing about the real problem, the big risk about binging is that when you're really drunk, you can do stupid things like no, fall, absolutely. fall under a bus, fall under a train. And so um, you can die. And that is the, you know, that or, is a very bad outcome. sadly, you know, hurt yourself, you know, permanently. Yeah, um, you get break. Yeah, I mean, people decide to jump off things, into things, in front of cars. About 10 people a year in Britain die drunk, jumping into the sea from piers, thinking, not realising that when they hit the cold water, they'll, their heart will stop. <laughs> I mean, it's... You, people, drink makes you do really stupid things. But other drugs make you do stupid things. No, they don't. They? Not as much as alcohol. N- Absolutely, and cannabis definitely doesn't. What about what about LSD? Doesn't that make you do silly things? Rarely. Really? Oh, very rarely. I mean, it make, might make you think. What about crack cocaine? Things. Well, crack can make you do some silly things. I've, as well. I mean, I've, I've mm, s- yeah. seen an epidemic. I mean, an epidemic yeah. that I witnessed in Brazil. I mean, a yeah. street full. Of, they were smoking what they call Pedro stones. Yeah, yeah. But. One after the other, one after the other, and taking it with ecstasy. MDMA. It is more dangerous than alcohol, crack cocaine. I, I'm not recommending. And also the way that it hits and affects the brain, it, it's, it's far more extremely rapid. Extremely fast. And uh, yeah. So we're having a competition about, I've seen more than you've seen. Now I'm not. Well, I'm like, you've been, definitely, you've definitely. I've read what, more papers than you, but you've, you've seen, seen more of the reality. Uh, well, <laughs> the, uh, it, it is a, that's why alcohol gets a good rap, doesn't it? Because you can just go, well, look, he yeah. was doing that when he did that. That's let's ban those those yeah. awful drugs. Mm-hmm. But you know, they got into a pub fight. Right. Sort of somehow acceptable. Yeah, absolutely, it's 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 a very it's a hit mixture of historic use. It's a mixture of tradition. It's a mixture of lobbying. It's a mixture of all sorts of subtle pressure against other drugs and in favor of alcohol so they they lobby against other legalization of other drugs in particular to cannabis yeah i well in america they do i imagine it happens here but at a less obvious level Level. yeah and the americans were the first people to sort of come up with prohibition 
Yes. Was it right. ever was it ever muted historically here that we should ever have? Yes, it privilege? was. There was an amazing election. I think it was probably about 1923. 23. Um, so after the First World after War. The, this is yeah. And the Americans, I think, were bringing it in. In Dundee, Winston Churchill stood against the temperance movement. Candidate. Temperance movement were an anti-alcohol. Yep. Religious. And they movement. destroyed Churchill. Did they? He got, I think the temperance guy got twice as many. Churchill got about 17,000 votes. The temperance guy got about 35. Yeah, the temperance movement in Britain almost got alcohol banned. Almost did. And it's actually, I'm glad they didn't. Because look at look what happened. I mean, in America, thing, it's just like everything. If you ban anything, it just goes underground. Then it becomes criminalized. And worse, it creates criminal enterprises. There was, organized crime did not exist till prohibition in America. Mm. Prohibition basically made every single policeman corrupt because, and a lot of law-abiding individuals well, corrupt that, that because too. you went from saying I could go out and have a gin and tonic, and now I have to drink it out of a out of a teapot. But they went some, into speakeasies. You know, speakeasies. They went into speakeasies. Yeah, they went yeah. into speakeasies, and every speakeasy had to be protected by the policeman. So every policeman was corrupt. So they had yeah. to create a special army of enforcers. You know the you know the Elliot FBI. Ness, the Untouchables, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Thirty-five thousand man army to take on organized crime. So when I say to politicians, well, you you know, all this thing about prohibiting drugs, do you think uh, alcohol prohibition works? And they say, oh, no, that didn't work. Well, why would it be different for heroin, cocaine? Well, and they say, oh, oh, it's going to be different. But, well, why is it? It's not. The point is, and the problem is at one level, having created organized crime around drugs, yet we haven't been able to dismantle it. Is alcohol easier to manage than, say, marijuana? If if I was to smoke marijuana, I could probably grow it in my back garden mm. or hydroponically. Mm -hmm. um, I could smoke it before I came to work. I'd be less likely to be found out. My breath wouldn't smell. Mm -hmm. Depending on, on how much I, I, I took or ingested or whatever it mm. was. Um, is it because it's harder to detect that, that, that it's banned? Because, you know, you can put someone on a breathalyzer at work. I suppose you could put them on a you can THC oh, monitor. You can test people. I mean, this is one of the outrageous things they're doing in terms of roadside testing. So they're testing. If you get stopped now, the police in many parts will test your saliva for a range of drugs. Mm. Well, if you test positive for alcohol, the threshold is 80, right? Mm. Which is actually a threshold which does impair you. So it's perfectly reasonable to stop you driving mm. over that. But they've set the thresholds for other drugs at about a tenth of what impairs you. Right. About, so people are getting prosecuted so all the time. So you could not be affected or impaired by the yeah. taking of a certain drug, but you'll be f convicted for, for taking it because it's an illegal drug? Exactly. And, and it's out, uh, I think it's outrageous. They're using drug testing to try to stop people using drugs, even though they know it's not impairing their driving. I, I think it's another, it's another one of these oppressive decisions that the last government made just to try to punish people for using illegal drugs. Do you know, I was in uh, Belmarsh Prison recently and I was, um, they've got a massive issue, as all prisons have across the U Uni United Kingdom now with spice, Absolutely. right? Because mm -hmm. A, it's dirt cheap, you can get it in easy, mm -hmm. um, It's often often doesn't smell that much, mm -hmm. so you can smoke it away in mm -hmm. your cellar, no one knows mm -hmm. you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very profitable if you're a drug dealer. Super. Yeah. And there's so many different models and types Absolutely. out there. So if you ban one Absolutely. molecular formula, you make another one and you yeah. can put it on a bit of paper so big, which is like less than my thumbnail, and that will go for like five to ten pounds Absolutely. in prison, Absolutely. three times or four times its street its street value. Absolutely. So I inhaled what was the residue of a vape mm -hmm. while I was there, given to me by a prison officer mm -hmm. on camera. And I can only describe as I'm not often lost for words, yeah. but I was at that moment. Mm -hmm. And then I was told what I was smoking was something called man down. Mm -hmm. And it does exactly what it says on the mm -hmm. side of the tin. Jumpf, right? Mm -hmm. And what I, was, what I was told it was, and I was told this by the person that smoked it the next day when I knocked on his cell, because he had told me to go forth and multiply out of his cell at the time that he realized I was there with the film crew. In between, given citrus, actually, do you know that they they say that citrus knocks off the immediate effects of smoking spice, and they have no. So you'll see what they'll do. The first thing they'll do is give them some lemon or orange. Generally, it'll just knock off the original massive hit of the uh -huh. the first um, the first uh, smoke of spice, whatever you want to call it, the inhale yeah. inhalation of spice, and. Um, he couldn't recognize me. I couldn't say a word for a couple of seconds to the camera. And the next day, he knocked on his door. Didn't know 
that I'd ever been in this cell, wanting to know what I was doing in the prison. Why was I there? Um, and he said to me, I smoke it because it takes me three or four days to get over it. And that means I'm three or four days that I'm not in prison. Yeah, right. Yeah, so he's using it as a complete exit drug. Yeah. yeah but he told me what it was. He said, it's a mixture of aluminium cleaner and cockroach killer. So how, oh, right. so how are those chemicals who works out? that the chemicals that are in cockroach killer and aluminium cleaner are similar or have the same effect Mm -hmm. as as something that was originally based on THC, was it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm in no position to understand that, are you? Well, cockroach killers are chemicals. Yeah. I get that bit. Yeah. But why would they have... Aluminium cleaner will be probably an acid. Yeah. And the two together will probably react to produce uh, some volatile chemical that resembles spice or is yeah. spice. Well, well, does it matter what spice is? Is spice? Can you say one? Th- there are two types, aren't there? No. So no. Shall we start from? Come it's, on, let's go. Let's have a lesson in spice. Let's have a le- okay. So spice up your life. Once upon a time, there's nothing to joke about about me saying that. Oh, I have to say. Once upon a but time, but it is something that people were shouting at me from the prison after they, they found out that I'd inhaled it. Yeah. Yeah. So we used to have cannabis, you know, yeah. when I was a student, you know, it was resin or herbal. It was, mm. you know, 5% THC, 3% cannabidiol coming from Morocco or if you're lucky from Lebanon, everything was fine. Then we decided to get hard on cannabis back in the kind of 90s to start controlling it because the Americans decided, the Americans decided it was their number one problem. What, marijuana. Yeah, the- I do know one thing actually. I was out. Um, I was with the uh, DEA out on the border in Arizona, and they had what I can only describe as you know the scene in Raiders from the Lost Ark where the Ark of the Covenant is in the corner yeah. and they pull back. Yeah. It was a room like that, and it was bale after bale after bale of people who made it across from Mexico, right, being nabbed, sent back, or deported back after being chained. There and to the feet. Um, and there was bales and bales and bales. Because if you get it across and you get it to, to a dealer, you're actually allowed to stay with the dealer or the dealer will put you on a chain uh-huh. to stay inside the country as a legal immigrant. If you right. get caught, of course, yeah. ain't happening. But, you know, you, you risk death crossing that desert. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they had a massive incinerator there. Mm. And every week they burnt nearly, I think it was like, four tons to five tons mm. of marijuana. Mm. Marijuana doesn't weigh a lot. That's a lot of marijuana. Mm. And they reduced it into a little block, like an OXO cube, the size, you know, the size of a Rubik cube, and go, hey, we just got rid of all that marijuana. I have to say, the staff seem quite happy to work there. Well, you often see them downwind, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and also, ludicrously, because of the, just the odd words, the way that America breaks down between state, yeah. um, you know, municipal police, sheriff's department, one of the sheriffs on the border in another part of Mexico, uh, on the Juarez border, which is a very dangerous passing. I spent a lot of time there and saw the damage that drugs do in terms of violence. Four, four people getting shot on the hour every hour, right? People being skinned, people being decapitated, yeah, yeah. pretty awful things to witness, all over drugs, mm-hmm. all over drugs, manufacturing drugs and getting drugs across into the biggest market in the world. Um, but there was a sheriff on the other side that owned nine, nine trailer trucks, why did he need nine trailer trucks as a sheriff? Just what was he putting in? on the side. What was he putting? Uh, sand yes, from the desert but, cactus? He was a, yeah. Aloe. <laughs> yeah. Big glitch of aloe vera. Uh, anyway. Uh, anyway, that's another story. So, so, but you exempt, no, hang on. That, so that story is interesting because you pointed out it's very easy to stop the movement of marijuana. Because it's, it's big. big. And it's also, sorry, the point of my, my conversation was this. They said the only time that their officers, the Drug Enforcement Administration officers, had been killed was when they started spraying the crops of marijuana. Because if you're a crack, if you're a crack addict, mm. right, you're only good for three or four years. If you're yeah. a tweaker, yeah. two to three years. Yeah. If you smoke crystal meth, right? Yeah. All yeah. of which are being manufactured in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. So the cartels had control of that. But if you smoke marijuana... You could be a judge, yeah. you could be a copper, you could be a doctor, you could be mm-hmm. a road sweeper, you could be any other thing, and you're there for a long time. Absolutely. You're a captive audience you're for a very, absolutely. very long time. So th- that was the only time that their officers started getting hit. Yeah. That's so, what I was told anyway. Uh, that's perfectly credible. So we, were got, we got quite successful in stopping cannabis coming in from overseas. 
So what happens? People we started, started growing it you know, on their own. You in know, the roofs. That's right. Roof spaces. Using Vietnamese, Vietnamese kids, yeah. Now, on the street in Britain, 95% of what you buy is skunk. It's THC of 12% upwards, right? And what you, should it be naturally, do you know? Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, the, the traditionally sort of 4 to 6% THC, but, so you, but with CBD. So it's increased three times the strength, but you've lost the CBD. The CBD, the cannabidiol, is protective. So skunk is more addictive and makes you more crazy. Okay? So, that's so it, can f- have a, it can have an effect on your mental health. That's the first problem. The second problem was that, for some reason, no one really understands where this came from. It was not never discussed with the prison governors, but they decided to start testing for drugs in prison. Mm. I suspect there was a minister that was probably looking for a job in a testing company when he got sacked. I don't know, just a suspicion. And it, the decision was made, let's start testing prisoners. Now, you smoke a spliff, you can be te- the cannabis will be detected for a month. And prisoners suddenly worked out that they were being caught for having smoked a spliff. But heroin leaves your system very, very quickly. So what did they do? The first thing the prisoners did, they switched to heroin. And then they tried to switch to pregabalin, the prescription drug. But then it became harder to get those. So then... Someone had a clever idea. Well, why don't you smoke spice? So spice is a generic term for synthetic cannabinoids. So they're new molecules that act like super strong THC, but which are sprayed onto spice. They were were sprayed onto like bits of anything, a bit of greeny. Anything is green. You spray it onto that and then you started off smoking it like it was a... That was cannabis. Mm. But then people realize you don't need to spray it on things. You just soak your new paper in it. And yeah, then yeah you- it, was, it comes in in letters. And it's, Absolutely. But also the problem with that is I was told by, this is when I was in Barlini um, prison in Scotland, is it depends where, if they've hung, they've hung it up to dry, all the liquid drops to the bottom. That's right. So you're with your co-pilot in yeah. your prison, and you and I have decided to have, we've got a little bit. But my bit comes from up here, and I go first. I smoke mine. I'm absolutely fine. You smoke yours, but it came off the end of this bit of paper, the bottom bit where all the liquid soaked to the bottom, and it's 12 and 20 times stronger, absolutely. and you're ODing, or That's you're right. you know, you're know passed out and yeah. you're, you're gone. Possibly. But what's worse is that the, the, the first synthetic cannabinoids actually had been made and tested in humans back in the 1970s. So the, le- the legal, what were the legal highs? No, they've never been legal. But in that, sorry, this, but they were, they were never marketed. They were made to be super cannabis- medicines for things like nausea but they were never marketed why so, so they originally they were pharmaceuticals they were pharmaceuticals they, and they weren't marketed because they were so horrible when they gave them to people to they test beha- they had beha- everyone them. hated them and then the government decided well we're going to ban these first generation so-called synthetic cannabinoids but they were being sold in garages you could go and buy it in a garage couldn't you, yeah, you could but, buy it in a sweet shop well first. they yes yeah, so they weren't well they weren't and then they hadn't been formally made illegal that's true I mean, so, but then, then we were more made illegal, right? Mm, yeah. And then the second generation came along, but the second generation had never been tested in humans. They'd just been tested in rats. And this was coming from, was coming from China? These were all pharma. These were all pharma companies, but they were being remade in China. Yeah, yeah. So the government banned those. And then the third generation have just been invented based on chemical structure. So, so the so, first peop- the first exposure of these new compounds to any life form well, are in prisoners. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. just out- absolutely ridiculous. And it's all because we're obsessed with stopping prisoners smoking cannabis. In the Netherlands, they don't care. They don't test prisoners. Well, if a prisoner's stoned, it's much easier to, you know, for it's everyone to get by. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But we have created the monster of spice because we are obsessed with punishing people. Let's go, let's go back to alcohol. The size of the glasses have yeah, changed. They have indeed. They have indeed. You go into, yeah. you go into, you know, they don't ask, they say, do you want a glass of wine? And then suddenly this fishbowl turns yeah, up that's right. with like, you know, what was it's a, normal- third, it's a third of a pint, a third of a bottle. The, a large a is a third, third of, of a bottle. bottle. And do you know how quickly, you, if you're a Moorish and you're having a good time, that's... And that is why they shouldn't be sold like that. So when I was starting to drink wine, we, it was it was selling 125 mil glasses. And that, those were the standards. So just if give you an idea, that's about this, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, if someone it's, serves you a 125 mil glass, you think you're, you know, your beer ripped off. But in fact, most places don't tell you what that's by law they should but most most bars don't tell you the price of 125 most people say do you want a larger medium a medium but in fact you know the, you could ask i'd have a small you please. can and they must by law serve you a small but it, we've got so uh, inured to the expanding size of wine glasses that a small looks almost a joke 
And that's a problem. We've got to shift that back. Remember so we're, we get, sort of, we're sort of being conned, aren't we? We're, we're sort of being controlled. We are being controlled. We're absolutely. We're being subtly manipulated by yeah, an industry that spends hundreds of millions of pounds a year telling you how wonderful alcohol is. How much money are they making, though? Well, the drinks industry is the most profitable industry that, because, I mean, alcohol is so cheap to make. I mean, obviously, they pay a lot of so, tax. Okay, come on, here we go. This is going to get people going. Going to get me angry. Get come me on. angry, Dave. Oh. How much money does it cost to produce a can of lager, then? About 2p. How much do they sell a can of lager for? Uh, well, say a pound. That's a lot of profit. Which is. Is it... it this, yes, absolutely. Do you know, do you know, it's, it's ridiculously easy to make money selling booze. I mean, obviously, they've got a lot of advertising and marketing. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of tax. But it is, it is a, it's a ridiculously easy market to make money in. So the main cost to the producers of alcohol in this country is tax. Yeah, that's right. No wonder you got sacked from, you know, what, you were asked to resign. <laughs> I mean, you sound so on side. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I read the notes for this interview. I went back, well, I went to through Paddington, as I will, not every night, I hasten to add, not go through Paddington. I went to Marks and Spencer's, bought myself my, you know, my pasta dish or whatever it may be, and also took a, 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 a cheeky bottle of, of Pinot Noir. The tiny bottle, I hope. No, the large one, oh, though, okay. trust me. Oh, right, so. um, and, but, and as I read the notes on the train, the bottle in my backpack became more and more and more unattractive to me, I have to say. So if you said, you know, drink your book, what is the, is the ultimate message inside the book? Oh, very straightforward. The ultimate message is think about drinking. Don't drink reflexly. Don't drink because everyone else is drinking. Don't drink because you've always drunk. Sit down and have a mature conversation with yourself about what you're drinking, why you're drinking it. And whether the benefits you get from drinking outweigh the harms. And the harms are in there. You can co compute the harms to you at your level of drinking and you can make that decision. Dave, Professor Nutt, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Ross. <laughs>